Namaskar, warm greetings from Dell Net Developing Library Network, New Delhi and British Council, India. Distinguished and esteemed Mrs. Liz Jolly, Chief Librarian, British Library, London, UK, and the invited speaker of today's program. Mrs. Neeti Saxena, Senior Manager, Digital Library, South Asia, British Council, India. Sri K. Jayakumarji, President Delhi, Dr. S. S. Murthy, Vice President, Dr. P. R. Goswami, Treasurer, the GP members, the officials of British Council in India and many other countries, the eminent librarians, library experts, library and information science professionals, HODs and faculty members of various departments of library and information science, Department of Computer Science, IT, officials of various leading publishers, researchers, scholars, students, Delnet staff officials here at its New Delhi office and also in its uh, units, including at Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, ladies and gentlemen. I, Sangeeta Kaul, Director Delnet, on behalf of Delnet Developing Library Network and British Council India, extends a very warm, hearty welcome to all of you for joining us in person here at Delnet New Delhi and also online from various parts of India and many other countries, including Bangladesh, Bhutan, Canada, Indonesia, Iran, Mali, Nepal, Nigeria, Qatar, Sri Lanka, UAE, UK, and USA, the Delnet British Council lecture on library partnerships in an age of openness, which will shortly be delivered by our most esteemed speaker, Mrs. Liz Jolly, the Chief Librarian at British Library London, UK. It's a moment of great honor and privilege to have with us today, Mrs. Liz Jolly, on behalf of Delnet, British Council India, and the entire Library and Information Science fraternity in India and all our attendees. We extend a very warm, hearty welcome to you, Mrs. Liz Jolly, to India and the most incredible land with infinite possibilities, diverse cultures, languages, and traditions. We remain indebted to you for your very gracious presence with us today. We would like to welcome our distinguished guests with a bouquet of fragrant flowers. And may I have a pleasure of doing so. I have immense pleasure in welcoming Mrs. Neeti Saxena, Senior Manager, Digital Libraries, South Asia, British Council, New Delhi, and a wonderful professional colleague for past nearly three decades. We express our sincere thanks to you, Neeti, for providing Delnet an excellent opportunity to collaborate with British Council India in organizing today's program. It will further strengthen the Delnet British Council networking partnership we would like to welcome Mrs. Neeti Saxana with the bouquet of flowers, and I would like to request Mrs. Sushma Zuchiji to kindly present a bouquet of flowers on behalf of each one of us. Thank you very much, Neeti, for your excellent you know, help always and always being so helpful. Thank you very much. Library Network, a resource sharing library network whose journey started as a city based library network more than 30 years ago, has now nearly 7,800 institutions as its members spread across the country and many other countries. It is the single largest library network in South Asia, which is working relentlessly to network and empower the libraries and inspiring the library professionals by providing its vast spectrum of library resources and services. Today, we all witness the relevance of open mantra for building knowledge society, which includes open access to information, open source software, open standards, and open collaborations. The invited talk on library partnerships in an age of openness by our distinguished expert speaker, Mrs. Liz Jolly, will certainly open up new vistas for global library partnership in the area of library and information science. I would now like to request Mrs. Neeti Saxena to kindly deliver an opening address. I have an immense pleasure in introducing Neeti, with whom having an association of past more than three decades. Neeti has been a well-known library and information science professional with over three decades of working with the British Council Libraries. In her current position, Neeti is leading on the delivery of a digital library in 40 countries across the network, South Asia, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. She focuses on product development of mobile applications, website content, web portal, digital walls, and many other technological innovations 
needed for digital library in close license with external suppliers and internal teams. A proud privilege for me to request UNEP to kind of deliver an opening address. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone present in the room and uh, present online. So thank you, Delnet, for hosting this session with the British Council. We are happy to be collaborating with Delnet and look forward to this opportunity to be able to connect with our community of librarians spread across the globe. Um, the British Council is the United Kingdom's international organization for educational opportunities and cultural relations. The British Council creates international opportunities for the people of the UK and the other countries and builds trust between, the, between them worldwide. The British Council is recognized across India for its three cultural centers and libraries. The library offers both physical and digital libraries. So, you know, we have it in Delhi, Kolkata, and Chennai, our offices, but our digital library is all across. We curate monthly and showcase our book collection on the topic, both in our physical spaces and in digital, to create an interest in books. And our digital libraries host a wide range of resources ranging from fiction, newspapers, magazines, movies, training materials, concerts, music, audiobooks, and children's resources. We also have an exclusive corner in our digital library hosting the British Council collection, like, for example, research, research reports, British Council film archives, and many more. Our digital library has a global reach of 100,000 members in approximately 40 countries. Along with the library, British Council offers a range of specialized projects in arts, education, English language, and society to audience across India. We provide access to English language training material and learning for both for students and for professionals. Uh, in this year, last year, we celebrated India UK together, a season of culture. This was a celebration friendship between UK and India, making the 75th anniversary of India. This cultural exchange showcased a vibrant range of programs of events across music, theater, cinema, literature, fashion, and visual arts. We worked with partners for this event and our ambassador for the season was A.R. Rahman. Right, we work a lot with partners and today is one of one of such collaborations that where we do, we are working with Delnet. Thanks to Delnet once again for hosting this list and organizing this session for the benefit of our library community. Hope all of us enjoy this session and will have to carry a lot of learning and sharing during the session today. Thank you. very much Niti for all your support and for setting the tone of today's program. The moment has now finally arrived to welcome once again our esteemed speaker, this is Liz Jolly, and to invite her to deliver a talk on library partnerships in an age of openness. It's a profound privilege and honor for me to welcome once again Mrs. Liz Jolly and to introduce uh, her to all our August audience. Mrs. Liz Jolly has been a chief librarian at British Library since September 2018. She is responsible for teams delivering core activities such as collection development, services for researchers, learners, businesses, and entrepreneurs, research strategy and digital scholarship, international engagement, and extensive cultural program of exhibition events and the library's online presence. Liz has over 30 years of experience in variety of institutions in the UK university sector, most recently as Director of Student and Library Services at Tassaday University. An honorary professor of Tassaday Liz, Liz is a Principal Fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy and a Fellow both of the Philip, the UK's Library and Information Association and the Royal Society of Arts. Mrs. Liz was also the Chair of SCONAL, the, the UK's University Library's Directors Group from 2014 to 2016 and is currently a trustee of CLIP and a governor at the University of Portsmouth. Liz is an editorial board member of the New Review of Academic Librarianship. It's a profound honor and privilege to request you, Liz, to kindly deliver 
invited to talk on library partnerships in an age of openness. It's indeed a great honor. It's a moment that we are going to cherish and treasure forever. Thank you so very much for giving us, you know, this chance, a blessed moment to have you with us today. Thank you very much. It's a great Well, and, and thank you for inviting me. I think the, uh, the privilege and the honor are, are with me. Everyone can see, see those, those slides. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about uh, library partnerships in an age of, of openness. And so it's a thing that started me uh, thinking about this was actually uh, when uh, I was in another meeting in the UK, which is exercising the library profession there, as I'm sure it is globally, uh, in terms of open scholarship, open access to research outputs. And a lot of our talk as libraries um, in the library sector as librarians is very much at the moment focused on the publishing aspect of the scholarly communication cycle, on the publishing model, on our relationships with publishers. And I suppose what I started thinking about, and, and I and, and colleagues with me, was that if scholarly outputs still remain inaccessible to large sectors of our communities, and when I say communities, I use that in the sense of the people we serve. So at national, regional, local, and, and hyperlocal, are we developing a truly open society? And I suppose my thinking then moved on to, to considering how a national library can work in partnership across library sectors to contribute to the sense of library resources, services, uh, and staff and spaces to contribute to that openness in its broadest sense. So I'm going to talk about um, what uh, the role of the National Library could be and to focus on some of the things that the British Library is doing uh, to, to um, contribute towards that openness. I'm going to um, talk a bit about, though, how the National Library developed, and it might look like a bit of a detour, but it will all come together at, at the end. And also, I thought you might find it interesting to, to know where the British Library has come from, because it's not always, the, it's not actually what a lot of people might think. So as a National Library, we are not yet 50 years old. That Act of Parliament was, which created us was passed in 1972. We came into being on the 1st of July, 1973. So we're 50 years old later this year. And the picture on the top right, that's the domed reading room of the British Museum. And that's what lots of people think that the British Library is about. The British Museum was founded in 1753 and is, is to many people's, and that reading room is, is many people's ideal of, of, of a, a national library reading room. What lots of people are not aware of is the institution on the, um, on the left, uh, and not such a nice photograph either, but they're quite hard to come, come across. That was the National Central Library, which was founded in 1919 as the National Library for Students. And it was founded by a man called Albert Mansbridge, who in the UK founded something called the Workers' Educational Association. And so he was concerned with supporting people, all working people who wanted to learn but couldn't afford higher education. So they went to classes in his Workers' Educational Association, and when they wanted a library, they would come here to this National Central Library. Two years, the library was worked out that people not just in London wanted to learn. So they started sending books to public libraries in Manchester and Birmingham and Leeds and, and Scotland, places throughout the UK. And so this started being a centre of interlibrary loan in the UK. And then by the 1930s, it was published, it was, it was funded by the government. So we had from the National Central Library, from a place which was about helping ordinary people access information, we had a national centre of interlibrary loan and sharing library resources. And the government decided that science ought to be a big, big thing in, in the UK. And so in a place in Yorkshire, a long way north of, of London, they created the National Lending Library for Science and Technology. And so that was going before the creation 
of the British Library. And there's a, um, there's a map of where um, Boston Spa is compared to London. So it takes about two hours on a, on a British train. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a, or a bad thing. Um, so that's where we are. So those are three of the main institutions that came together. On the creation of the British Library, the National Central Library activities moved up to, to Boston Spa. And we became the center of the UK uh, interlibrary loan network. So again, a lot of our work is concerned with access to and sharing information, both for academic researchers, but also for anyone who wants to know more about anything. So anyone who is curious. After the, um, the creation of the National Library, um, that might look like a picture of an old building site to you. This is the building of the new library building at King's Cross, which took 20 uh, years to get going. There was massive, massive op opposition to it, um, questioning whether it was necessary. It was at a, a time, it was at a time when this place was a sort of no person's land, not the sort of place you went around after dark. People said it was in the wrong part of London. And already by the time it was finished, it's stored, it was nearly full. So lots and lots of controversy. And that, so you'll agree, it is a beautiful building. What I want to say is that building libraries, and you all know that as librarians, are not just those buildings. They are about the spaces, they're about the content and resources, they're about the staff and their expertise as librarians who enable people to find the resources and to develop those information literacy skills that are really important to function effectively in a democratic society and to have pleasure too and to enjoy um, learning and discovering. But the Buildings here, I suppose I'm just talking about the British Library in, in terms of, of representation or building that single entity. This is Boston Spa. You'll see it's in the middle of Yorkshire countryside, the top right picture. And the bottom left picture is both old and new. So the actual things um, on the shelves there are um, 18th and 19th century print newspapers but they are stored in one of our newest buildings. It's called, appropriately enough, the additional storage building uh, and, the, and the newspaper building, there are, there are two of them now. And they are retrieved by robotics. You press a button, button and something fetches it for you, it's like magic. Uh, sorry, I never fail to get excited when I go in there. So this strategy, and you'll notice from that, it says 2015 to 2023. We are going to be publishing a new strategy and I can hint about some of the stuff that's going to be in there, but that's not published for another couple of months. So it coincides with our 50th anniversary. But we, as it says there, of making our intellectual heritage accessible to everyone. That's everyone. And that is something that I think we and, and everyone needs to hold on to. So we're not just about academic research. We're not just about people who, who can afford um, uh, certain sorts of universities. We are about everyone. We're about research, but we're also about inspiration. And we are about enjoying the content, the, the print resources, the digital resources that we have uh, in our collections. Us as having six purposes. So the first and perhaps the most obvious one is, is around custodianship. We see ourselves as looking after the UK's national collection um, for future generations. And again, we buy some things, but actually we're a legal deposit library, and I'll come on to that, which means that publishers have to give us a copy of everything published in the UK. Research. So what research in a university, and as, as, um, as I said in my introduction, research in a university means a certain sort of thing. We see research as meaning any sort of knowledge discovery. So it might be an academic, but it might be someone wanting to know a bit more about their family history. Businesses, and I'll come on um, to more of that later about how we help businesses grow, but we very much see our role as helping businesses grow, helping regions regenerate. And you'll be aware that, that large parts of, of the UK are actually post-industrial and industries that kept uh, regions going uh, throughout the industrial revolution have declined. And so libraries have a key role in helping to regenerate those areas. Culture, so this is where we, um, we hold events such as exhibitions, which um, 
again, open up our collections in some way. We've had bands in the library. We have all sorts of talks and events. And that has certainly brought in a new group of people into our buildings. And we, since COVID, we've actually been doing that a bit like today's event online. So learning is the phrase that is word that we use actually to mean families and young people. So that's again about encouraging people who you might not usually expect to see in a, a very traditional UK type national library in, in, into the British Library. And internationally, we really feel that we are part of a global library community. We want to advance knowledge in its broadest sense. We want to advance knowledge about librarianship and information uh, work. And we want to develop mutual understanding around what we're doing, why we're doing, and how we can solve some of society's biggest challenges. With the library, we have 170 million items, as it says there. That picture on the um, left, on the right, sorry, I can't tell my right from my left, um, is called the King's Library, and it is a collection that is um, George, painted George III, a, a monarch, an, um, a 19th century monarch, 18th century monarch in the UK. The interesting thing about that space is I said the building took 20 years from planning to, to, to completion. That space was designed as a catalogue hall with card catalogues, and I'm sure those of you who, who uh, I started my, my life as a cataloger, and I used to have to write on cards and then put them in a drawer with ignition needle things. That was to house that. And between uh, being planned and, and being completed, library cataloging was automated. So it's once a lovely space for that, but also um, a remembrance of, of that libraries endure, but libraries also, and, and library practice also changes. So 170 million items, and that's an, an example of the sorts of things we do. We are not just books, obviously. We have some stamps, but we also have a large collection of sound recordings. We don't have film, uh, but we do have sound. And that just tells you about the sorts of um, visitors that we, we have um, in, in terms of sorts of usage that, that we have there. So 17,000 visits, 20 um, to our reading rooms, but also visits online and consultations, again, talking um, people to our experts about what they want and finding out if we can help them and us using our librarianship skills to deliver the, um, the uh, information that they need. We're very keen to um, have our work informed by values. Now, I'm not going to read them out there, but I think the most important actually are around putting users and perhaps the heart of everything we do really thinking about that and I think all of them are important but to collaborate to do more than we could by ourselves I think in the past great libraries and perhaps actually I would speak for myself and the UK profession we thought that we have all the answers and I will come back to this again no one person no one library has all the answers and we can be immeasurably stronger by working with others of our partnership working. I'd be interested to hear if anyone's doing something similar. And I, I think the little I've learned of Delnet today, I think it's a fantastic example of, of partnership working and something I'm definitely going to take back with the UK, uh, with me. So we work across library sectors, and you'll see there um, public, academic, legal deposit. We have a new initiative called the Green Libraries Park. The Alan Turing Institute was set up by the UK government, and it's a data uh, research unit that's actually housed in the same building as us, although they're a very separate organisation. So, we have our part partnerships with public libraries. I'm going to talk about our business and intellectual property centres, our living knowledge network, and library on. One of the things that we're beginning to do is take a strategic view to our partnerships. And um, and we brought the uh, BIPC uh, and the Living Knowledge Network together under a strategic board so that we can begin to plan with our public library partners more effectively and more strategically going forward. Library on is slightly different when I come to that as, as, as this is something we are developing for a funding body in the UK. So 
intellectual property center network because it says there's a collaboration and it is about um giving people information that they need to help successfully start their business started in 2011 with a regional pilot in Newcastle City Library, which is right in the north of England, just, just south of the, the border with Scotland. And by 2019, you'll see there where we've had 12 centres in England and one in Glasgow. Now, part of that is to do with funding. I talk about the UK, but you'll be aware that England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland are all funded slightly differently. So some of this is about England and some of it's about the UK, confusingly. So in 2020, just as we were going into lockdown, we had £13 million from the UK government to expand this because, as I'll come on to in a minute, we had really, really effective data around the impact of these centres on the local economy. And one of the conversations I've had today and I have in the UK all the time is that li libraries and librarians do great work for their communities don't do is tell the stories about our impact and what we don't do as a profession and I can only speak of the UK is um, is evaluate effectively and then disseminate that ev that evaluation to the people who matter I use is matter in terms of giving us more money to do what we want to do and and so this is a really powerful story of getting speaking the right language and getting um, that information to people with with the money evaluation we got that 30 million pounds to expand and, and previously initial iterations of the centers had been one in Newcastle one in Manchester one in Birmingham what they wanted us to do was to do a hub and spoke model that was in smaller towns and didn't actually limit itself to um, administrative boundaries so um, the Newcastle city one is now called um, BIPC Northeast and has um, spoke centres in Northumberland County, that's the rural area outside Newcastle, and in several of the other metropolitan boroughs in the northeast, for example. Uh, economic impact analysis we had done. We have just had some more done, but because there are local government elections in the UK, we are not allowed to um, share information that might have any bearing on any uh, election whatsoever until they're over so i can't share that information with you but this is the sort of thing that we 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 have repeated again and despite the pandemic i would say it's surprisingly good so you'll see that that that's the number of jobs um, you'll see around the um, diversity um, and about women about um, black asian and minority ethnic people in the uk about disabled people in the uk who generally in, in business statistics are underrepresented. In terms of, oh, let me go back. In terms of, of the people with the impact, um, it's that £6.95, the third blue uh, figure down there, a payback of £6.95 for every one pound of public money spent on those centres. Now, into, that is the figure that got us more investment. So I think the lesson is for, for us is thinking about how we can demonstrate impact that we used in, in this, um, in evaluating this service and carry that forward into different areas of our services. Living Knowledge Network, some of these places are actually the same, which is why we, um, why we uh, are, are, are looking at, uh, or we have started a strategic board to manage these partnerships. But this is um, about a UK-wide partnership with a focus on cultural events and people using their library more generally. And so it's a partnership with um, the national libraries in Scotland and Wales, as well as the British Library, and um, currently 31 library partners. And those are just the authorities. That's 31 out of 151 authorities in England alone. But as it says there, that means that all their local libraries are involved, and that's nearly a 1,000. And these are the sorts of things we do. We have events, we hold exhibitions, um, we live stream talks. Um, I, my favorite uh, picture, which is not here, is, um, in fact it is, but you probably can't see it, is Margaret Atwood, the Canadian author, giving a talk to people in Aberdeen. So, you know, you can really, and then that was shared across the country. 
So that's about thinking about what libraries are for, engaging people differently. The other thing that we do is share our exhibitions to local public libraries and help them to put those, those on with local resources. And again, a bit like Delmet, we, we offer some peer-to-peer -peer support and staff development. Um, and again, you'll be aware that the um, funding for public libraries in the UK isn't what it was even, even 10 years ago. So thinking about ways that we can share resources, that we can advocate and that we can support our professional peers is really, really important. As in library always on, but also in library on continue, is something that we were commissioned to do by the Arts Council, who are the body who fund uh, libraries in England only, and this is where it gets confusing. So it is a government funded, indirectly government funded program, and it is about building a web uh, and a digital presence that is around connecting libraries. Now, it, we think that initially people were thinking about a single library management system, and that isn't going to happen because people are getting together on their own volition. And also, those of you who worked with library management systems will know how, what a complicated uh, thing that is to do. So this is around advocating for libraries, connecting libraries up um, around digital transformation. And we've just had a soft launch about this week. And it's around celebrating libraries, about positioning those, getting people to think about them, and looking at, at what libraries have to offer. We're actually looking at how we can develop services. So again, this may well be a platform for, for us to deliver a new interlibrary loan, a reinvigorated interlibrary loan services on service on, or to think about having a shared inquiry service. So it, it, it's both an advocate um, site for public libraries, a way into public libraries, and has the potential to think about shared services. But again, we wanted to be realistic and start small. We're offering grants to public libraries to see what they want to do to, to, um, to develop their elements of that service. Quick look at Save Our Sounds, which was a national partnership around sound recordings. And again, you'll see that the partnerships there were universities, were archives and museums, so not just, just libraries. And that, that project has just finished and looked at digitizing at risk sound recordings. So we hold a copy of that, but also locally, local uh, copies are held in all those places. Then our newest partnership, the Green Libraries Partnership, um, so that's there, what, what it's, it's doing. We partnered with a, a charity called Julie's Bicycle and with SILIP, who are the um, Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, so the professional body for the UK. Uh, we held our first Green Libraries con um, conference and the um, members are giving out small grants for people to seed corn initiatives around getting people to think about sustainably locally and then share it nationally. I think, you know, as we've said before, libraries are the ultimate in sustainability. We're about sharing a finite resource. So how can we encourage people to broaden that thinking across, across their lives and to learn more about what the climate emergency means? So with academic libraries moving on, UK Research Reserve, sorry, I haven't, oh, that's, that's our website there is around preserving printed collections, allows um, universities to deduplicate their journal holdings, but also to have easy access. So the point is you can get rid of stuff. You can then start planning more interesting library physical spaces. And I'm sure you know libraries in the UK, libraries around the world have really been thinking about what learning and research space means, but also maintain that easy access. And uh, sorry about my spelling there. We always keep two copies, one at the British Library and making sure there is one elsewhere in the UK. And that started as a project and is now a service with growing numbers of members. The print legal deposit. Well, we've been collecting stuff uh, under legal deposit um, for a good few centuries, for about 400 years now. In, 19, in 2013, the government decided that we needed to um, start uh, collecting uh, non-print or what people would call digital these days. So the act that, that enabled us or mandated us to do it uh, was extended to cover material published digitally and online. So that includes the web and every six months we do a trawl of the web for everything that ends with .uk. Obviously we, we couldn't, we'd be here all, you know, 
forever um, trying trying to do more than that. And in even with that, we we know that we don't get absolutely everything. But also published material, ebooks, journals, websites, blogs, those, those sorts of things. So we work in partnership with those six legal deposit libraries there. So two other national libraries, Oxford and Cambridge and Trinity College, Dublin, Dublin, but also the publishers, because they are instrumental in making sure that we are, are, are able to, to collect what we need to do. And so since 2013, we haven't done everything that we might want to do, but that's those are the sorts of figures um, that we've we've done um, sorts of, of successes that we have had. And from a standing start as a group of six people, like six libraries and, and publishers, I think we, we it's easy to feel we haven't done enough. There are all sorts of um, ongoing debates about access. You have to go into a legal deposit library to access stuff. There are worries from the publishers about what this means for copyright and so on that we're still talking through. But the fact is that we have preserved this and there is some access. Alan Turing Institute, Living with Machines, was a research project with a focus on history, but it was using data-driven approaches, thinking about new workflows, working with some partner universities, but also working with the public who could do crowdsourcing tasks like uh, sometimes um, PDFs of old newspapers are unreadable by machine, so getting people to go back and use something like Zoo University to get people to reread them and to correct the, the type and getting all sorts of really interesting engagement from people on that. And again, we digitized large numbers of, of 19th century newspapers, maps uh, and books and census data. And then we had a, a museum with Leeds City, an exhibition with Leeds City Museum last year. is something that we, we do um, internationally as well. Uh, two centuries of Indian print, as you see there, was digitization of works in our South Asian collections, um, 18th and uh, 19th and 20th century. And we work with partners in India um, to, to digitize those and make them available online. Then with the um, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, we uh, worked with them to actually make 800 medieval manuscripts available online and the whole manuscript was, was um, digitized um, in full to be it, so that we were able to create new primary sources available online. Archives program is a slightly different way of approaching digitization internationally. Um, that is around going to the countries where the archival material is held and actually helping people to kickstart their digitization pro projects, think about equipment and helping them to train their staff. Um, and so the program is about sharing expertise and knowledge and, and going to where the material is, is held. And as, as it says there, we've got over 400 projects going currently in, in 90 countries. So looking to the future, and this is um, an architect's drawing where, uh, of some developments that we're doing at Boston Spa. At the moment, Boston Spa is, in, is literally in the middle of a field in Yorkshire, um, and uh, not too many non-library uh, staff come there, and we want to open that up. And that was, that's a sort of robotic storage building. That's an architect's drawing of how we could have people watching the robots move. And I think, well, if that, that entertains me, why wouldn't it entertain anyone else? The proof of that may, uh, may be a long time in, in coming. So living knowledge is our current uh, strategy. As a response to the pandemic and how we felt after the pandemic, after Brexit, after the murder of George Floyd, how we needed to be a different sort of national library. Also to continue the golden thread from the past, so balancing both. And so Living knowledge for everyone was an updating of our strategy. And I think the key line for, for, for us um, in that was highlighting, and I think it was implicit in, in the original living knowledge, was around bringing people together through libraries. As I say, working on, on BL 2030, which we published in a couple of months. What we think the trends are in a, in a changing world, some of them, you know, exhaustive list, and these are things I want to focus on for the remainder of, 
our time here. Digital transformation, artificial intelligence, technology generally, all those issues around equity, diversity, and inclusion, sustainability, and the climate uh, emergency, and what, what that means for partnerships, collaboration, and um, co creation. Ask some questions here. I don't have the answers, but if we're thinking about digital transformation or digital inclusivity, in any society, not everyone has access to digital that that um, libraries uh, think they have. For example, you know, in the UK during lockdown, schools had to give out laptops because their homework was being um, and, and their lessons were being delivered, and not everyone had laptops. Some children were trying to do school lessons on a phone when the actual um, software was designed for laptops. Uh, not only the software, the information and digital literacy. How do people know how to operate effectively in a digital world? We can argue that, you know, we all know how to use a phone. It's all, all um, obvious, isn't it? But it's not for everyone. And it assumes, assumes certain learning styles. And we just need to be aware of that and make sure that if we're saying we're going to work in a digital society, I would argue it's hybrid, physical and digital for a long, long time to come to resurrect the 1990s phrase. But if we're going to work in a digital world, how do we ensure that we're, we're inclusive in terms of digital skills and use of that digital? How do we deliver the whole open science and, and openness in general transformationally? As I said at the beginning, large parts of, of, the, the, of scholarly publishing are still inaccessible. And what can we do as professionals to drive forward that openness while respecting that in um, a capitalist society, publishers do have that right to, to make money too. Let's finish this uh, slide with a quote from Daniel Kahneman, um, which I thought was very interesting. He was interviewed in the Guardian UK newspaper. And this is, long before the dawn of chat gpt this is this is a, um, a good couple of years you know, 18 months before but he just said ai is going to win it's going to be our master it's quite frightening actually at the time it's about how we adjust so already i'm seeing as someone who spent my life in, in universities a repetition of, of the um unease that greeted wikipedia for those who've not on a, a different scale entirely about how it was the end of, of um, information, um, of, of um, uh, neutral information. Now, you can argue that for a long time, information hasn't been neutral. There was a, a, another article in The Guardian saying you can't trust anything on Google, on, that you find on Google after December 2022. Now, you know, you can say, could you trust it all beforehand? So it's about, about what you make of artificial intelligence, how we adjust it, what that means for information and digital literacy, for example, and as librarians, how we support our communities in a world where our AI is widespread and insidious in, in terms of where it is and people might not know what, it, what it's doing. Obviously, AI has all sorts of um, positive or more positive potential in terms of metadata creation and, and back of house library work, want a, a, a better phrase, but let's think about what that means for our, our, our users too. In terms of um, uh, the UK at the moment, um, race equality is, is a very big issue there, um, as is the whole issue around social class, which in the UK, um, as with, with um, is quite often um, something that people are uncomfortable speaking about, and it's not actually a protected characteristic at the moment. But whichever society we're living and working in, what are we doing as librarians to think about and to eliminate the effects of structural privilege? If we're really being open and we want that open society, what are we doing professionally? Whatever that structural privilege is and however it, it plays out in your community. And what are we doing about enabling people to feel that they belong? I love that word belonging in terms of, of inclusivity. It's not just inclusivity can sometimes suggest that we're doing something to enable you to come along to our things, to join our library, to 
borrow our book. People feeling that they have a right to be there, to be part of your community. And what are we doing about that? What am I doing as someone who works as a senior leader in the British Library about opening up those doors and making people feel that we are the National Library for everyone? Those pictures there are, are about our anti-racism action plan and SILIP, uh, again, the professional association um, for librarians in the UK has started a network for black, Asian and minority ethnic staff um, to, to um, support their development and to, to support broader discussion of the issues affecting uh, communities in the UK. Inability. One of the things I like about the um, IFLA UNESCO goals is that it broadens out the whole issue of the of climate emergency into one about um, global equality. So the only global society that is, um, that is sustainable is an equitable one. And I think particularly uh, in, in, in Europe, we've often put sustainability and green issues here and left the rest of the, the global issues over here. And this is really forcing us to think differently. And in fact, there's the Green Libraries Manifesto at the bottom of that slide, um, which is, is the first piece of work from the um, Green Libraries Partnership. And it's talking about its top pledge, it, it, it's interesting to, to look at, it's talking about bringing environmental sustainability to the heart of decision making. So that includes us as librarians and equipping our communities with climate literacy, with the skills to think about what that actually means for them and their families and their society too. When Carson wrote about the health um, sector in the UK, and I quite like the circulating nature of that, collaboration is what we do when we engage in a partnership. We can go round and round with that one. But they were talking about how things needed to change professional development, professional learning needs to change if we're going to train people, if as a profession, we are actually going to work strategically in partnerships and collaboration. Richard Sennett um, in, in Together talks about um, a dialogical model of cooperation. So this is about empathy and curiosity and wanting to work with and know more about people who are completely different to you. And therefore, the end result of that is, is in a library context is that we deliver services and, and, and resources and which are better suited to the needs of our communities. And Kahala had and Ramaswamy took, spoke about um, co-creation in the Harvard Business Review in terms of, of um, the commercial sector. Mike Neary in the UK wrote about it in the UK higher education system in terms of students co-creating their curriculum with their lecturers. There is a move in the UK at least and, and to, to start thinking about working together and a sort of continuum of ways of working together, sorts of partnerships. And you know, co-creation to me seems the most radical in terms of actually being getting your users, your communities working with you at the beginning, using something as UK librarians have, have been wanting to do in the past. But I would also then add um, my, one of my favourite quotes from Lorcan Dempsey, that great library thinker, who says it's hard. It is hard to do it. It's hard to do it if you're doing a small scale project or if you're working with people you know from other libraries who are similar to you. What Dempsey was saying there is that we actually need to think holistically and strategically about working together to try and alleviate that harness and to actually be more successful in, in leveraging the potential that we have as librarians in national and global communities, in, in making our society a, a better place. This is the end of my time now. But in the new um, strategy um, that, that the British Library is developing, and you'll see they reflect some of this. Access and inclusion around um, Continuing our work, there's some pictures of people in our local community, some of whom said they've never set foot in the library before we um, work with them on, on developing events. Literacy, as I say, and that's the Philip de definition, and I'll come to that. After we've not thought that that has been 
perhaps one of the key aims of, of a national library. Now we feel that it is absolutely at the root of what we do and it will inform our strategy going forward. Because it's around judgments, it's around empowering citizens and engaging fully with, with society. Um, again, we need to think about our digital infrastructure. If we're going to deliver things like library on the dimension previously, so thinking around um, uh, our library services platform, around making sure that people can discover what they need from search our catalog effectively. Well, again, I'm not going to read all those out, but we are extending the building at St Pancras. We're doing that building at, at Boston Spa to make sure that we are storing national collection effectively and making sure that we can share it more effectively with, um, with libraries across the UK. And we're also going to open um, uh, um, open a site, a public site, in the centre of Leeds City Centre. So that's a good couple of hundred miles north of, of London and making that collection accessible to people who might not be able to travel to, to London so easily. And that's an old 19th century flax mill that was bizarrely built to look like an Egyptian temple for uh, good 30 years now. Build on that sustainability and re resilient work that we're doing. And that's across the building, across our people, across what we do. And again, some of the belated thinking that the library profession is developing now is around the sustainability of digital, digital storage. In the UK, we've gone for all out digital first collection building, in the higher education sector at least. To do it. And actually, one way of alleviating the cost to the planet is making sure that if we have digital collections, we share them. And I would, would urge you to look at the work of Govinda Chowdhury at um, Strathclyde Library School, who, who's written, who has been writing about these issues for some time. In our partnerships, as I say, those that, that's we're visiting um, uh, the Living Knowledge Network and the BIPC partnerships, we want to make them bigger. We want actually to think about how we can send our collections, more of our collections to local places, how we can support people meet security and preservation requirements and enable more people to use our, um, our collection items across the UK, not just the form. And again, so just to conclude, those are uh, some of our, our reasons, some of the things we're doing with our partnerships. And I think that better offers for our community is really important. I think learning from other professionals and supporting innovation are, are really important aspects too. What that means for, for our professional practice, this is a very personal slide for me. I would say that for me, it's about continue to listen, to learn from others and to have curiosity. About as a practitioner, as a librarian, but also having professional confidence about what you can bring to these debates. All libraries are part of broader organisations, nationally, local, and university, wherever. Confidence about what you can bring as a librarian to the decisions, the debates about what you're going to do next. Personal authenticity and congruence as a leader, because you have to build trust with your partners and your collaborators and your co-creators. About, think about, I don't know, I hope everyone's seen those pages on, from UNESCO, about helping people to think about their future and think that they can um, have some control over it, not control in the sense of manipulation, but control in the sense of bringing their agency to their future. And for me, that builds upon information, media, and digital literacy, climate literacy, and encompasses all those things too. And thinking about and continuing to think and learn and discuss about what it means to be a librarian and to lead a library in a digital hybrid world. As I say, hybrid is some people say it's an old-fashioned word, word, but I think we are going to be hybrid for a long time. So think about why it is that libraries endure, what it is that we continue to do, form the how we deliver in the 21st century and that transforming and transform so that the how is both transforming and transformed 
one of my favourite library theories. So if this is our mission, it's about improving society through facilitating knowledge creation in our communities. My final remarks would be that this, that the American Library Association said only a couple of years ago, no library exists independent of the library ecosystem. So we need to, need to really, really think about library partnerships in our age of open data. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Liz Jolly, for delivering the most uh, insightful, enriching, and extraordinary talk, uh, truly highlighting the gigantic roles being played by uh, the British Library in ensuring uh, uh, you know, the partnerships on various fronts. There are a lot many, uh, uh, you know, thank you so much. I think you know, we, the Indian Library and Information Science Professionals, it has been an eye-opener to see uh, you have really demonstrated and the leadership in you, we, you know, we are able to see that through this slide that this presentation, a brief presentation, the presentation was brief, but the work that you are doing, you know, at British Library, highly commendable, you know, we heartily congratulate uh, you and the entire team, and we can very well can appreciate and admire it's all because of your leadership that the British Library is able to join our hands together, each one of us who are here at Delhi, in Del Nays, and also online in congratulating you, madam, and the entire team for setting an example for the world to the many national libraries, you know, that the kind of the partnership work that needs to be done at the national libraries. And you are really have the, the kind of examples that you gave. It's not the examples. These are more the inspiring and the most successful stories, right from living knowledge network. We have been talking about the knowledge networks. We have been talking about many things, but living knowledge networks, you know, which is conveying very strongly that we are working for the community. We are, we are there to support our society. Uh, also about this library on, that uh, that's really something uh, which, which really it's like a 24 by seven, you know, never ever it will get tired enough. And we should be the ones carrying those spirits to ensure that our libraries are always, always remain on, you know, for our users, for our communities. Thank you so very much indeed. Green libraries, partnerships that you have highlighted through your presentation, save our sounds, living with machines. These are, it's your presentation, each and every work that you are doing, it's really, um, we, uh, each and every professional, I believe, who has joined us, not only from India, from different nooks and parts of the world, uh, you have really inspired everyone to think uh, with a fresh new thinking, that what all can be done. And they, they should really think about building those partnerships wherever they are and wherever, whichever part of the world they may be, but they should always be open enough in this open era, you know, for ensuring that they are into the partnerships more. Even partnership for legal deposits that you have highlighted the work being done at the British Library. Uh, we are much grateful to you, ma'am, and also the Certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thought-provoking uh, uh, lecture that you have delivered, and also uh, more uh, introspection and retrospection that we need to do. Being a library professional, especially when you have spoken about to how to ensure digital inclusivity in a country like India, the South um, uh, Asian countries, or for that matter, the developing nations. Even this pandemic has shown us, you know, the digital have and have nots. How this gap has happened. And we are a little uh, even surprised enough that you have encountered the same even uh, in, a, in, in UK, uh, especially during this pandemic period. And we as uh, professionals also have to ensure how we can, can bridge up this gap which is happening in the society. And we witness that happening every moment. And also to have to deliver open transformationally, you know, that's again an important thing. And you also highlighted about AI, we have, we all speak about uh, chat bot, we uh, speak about, uh, you know, this, um, uh, our emerging trends which are happening, but yes, there is not much, we as a professional also has to safeguard because we are also responsible to ensure that we are able to deliver the information which is fit enough to, you know, to consume. Uh, and your, the, 
uh, it, it has truly been a great honor to hear from you. And uh, lastly, as you have spoken about, you know, these partnerships working together, you know, in a collaborative, in a cooperative, and a co-creation. So together, everyone, you know, these three C's, I think, that each one of us, um, you know, as a professional, wherever we are, we can be, we are in any new pen part of the world, but I think each one of us have to work together in a partnership mode, in an open environment to ensure that the three C's, that is collaboratively with a great corporation and contributing uh, to co-create. So it's a creation, you know, creating something bigger, but yes, each one of us, let's be a co-creators of that and you have truly inspired ma'am each and everyone over here which remain we remain much grateful to you for being there you have straight away from the airport you have been able to come down to deliver this talk we really can't thank uh, you enough for this and we remain much grateful to you forever thank you very much liz thank you so much indeed you know and this is not only from Delnet, from those who are here today but each one of us who have been uh, here you have really made us uh, to know that how these partnerships for a bigger purpose, the purpose is much higher and all of us have to contribute and become, uh, you know, a kind of an, a truly an active contributor in ensuring that we are doing something good for humanity at large. Thank you so very much indeed. With the permission now of our distinguished speaker, may I request Neeti uh, to join uh, because we would like to now make the floor open for questions and firstly would like to take uh, we have a privilege of having our professional colleagues here uh, at delhi but we would like to have this opportunity and well before we do that uh, i have an immense pleasure in informing uh, mrs Liz that we have our distinguished president of delhi shri k jay Kumarji, who is there with us uh, on this platform may i have a pleasure sir of requesting you to kindly share your words of wisdom, you know, on this occasion, wherein we have Mrs. Uh, Liz Jolly with us today. I'm requesting Shri K. Jayakumarji, the president, Elnet, to kindly say a few words on this occasion. It's over to you, sir. Thank you, Sangeeta. I think I'm audible. So very uh, much. Uh, thank you, Sangeeta, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. I had the privilege of listening to uh, Ms. Liz Jolly's wonderful talk about uh, library partnerships, uh, an age of openness. It was indeed a proud moment for Delnet that she has consented to be with us to deliver this Delnet British Council lecture. In fact, it is my, it's a pity that I could not be there personally, but I had the privilege of listening to you on online. Uh, it gives enormous inspiration for uh, Delnet in validating what Delnet is trying to do in our own uh, sphere. So the inputs that we have received today from Ms. Jolly is of considerable value and that will add, uh, it will give a new thrust and dimension dimension to the activities of Delnet. I do not want to steal further time from the other speakers and people who are trying to put across questions to her. I only want to thank you for accepting this invitation and gracing this occasion and also talking on a very, very relevant topic the library and information science, the landscape of library and information sciences is a very dynamic landscape. It is undergoing changes every, so constantly, so constantly it is undergoing change. Therefore, uh, if one uh, group of professionals have to be extremely alert, I think it is the library professionals who have to be uh, probably extremely alert and agile in adjusting to the changes that are taking place and also visualizing the contours of change that are taking place. So this kind of interaction from a person like uh, Ms. Liz Jolly, who has an overview of what is happening in the world today in the library sector, is of considerable value to Delnet. I thank you once again for a crazy location, for being with us. Thank you, Sangeeta, for organizing it so elegantly. And I hope to listen to you and see you in the days to come. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you again uh, for uh, thank you for those kind words and thank you all for uh, listening uh, and uh,
of Flood, except to say that I think Delnet's really inspiring. I really want to know, know more. Um, and it's been an, an absolute delight to be here and, and to speak with, with you all, to, to chat with some of you. And I really have valued this opportunity. I think the, the privilege is all, all mine, actually. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you so very much, Jolly. Now we would like to make the floor open for very quick questions already. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we are much uh, like now, you know, we need to ensure that they're able to have uh, at least some questions for next five minutes, making the floor right now open for all our online attendees. Firstly, would like to request online attendees, those who are here in person will come later. And uh, firstly, would like to request our online attendees, any question that you may uh, like to ask to our distinguished speaker, please kindly quickly raise your hand or even you can post your question in the chat box and we'll be very happy to take the questions from there. So please raise your digital hands if you have any questions. I'm uh, in the alphabetical mode. I'm just sifting through the entire list of attendees who may like to ask a question. In order to ensure that we can take quickly more questions in five minutes, may I request you, you can just can post your question in the chat box and we may like to take as many questions as possible. Just allow me a minute because I could see that we have um, uh, this question. Um, uh, Jolly, and this uh, question is from Dr. Isha Pabandi, who is wanting to ask that what kind of public libraries and academic libraries can collaborate uh, uh, to make a win-win uh, to both these systems? Uh, what kind of public libraries and academic libraries can collaborate to make win-win to both these systems? I think he's trying to find it out that how the, the public libraries and academic libraries can and you know can uh, undertake or can get into some kind of partnership. Any models that we have from UK? Oh, that's a dream I, I have in a UK library corporation. Uh, at the moment, corporation at national level is mainly public libraries and uh, academic libraries. There are a few remaining regional models and, and perhaps this this is the scale that which it, it works on where public um, and academic and health libraries in the UK have got together uh, for um, access to collections for staff development and for events but I think there's a lot more that could, could wonder if you start local and, and scale up from that but I'd be interested to hear if anyone else has any good examples Add to it, but right now I can see that you know, this entire I can see that there are this entire uh, chat box has been flooded with the the questions for you. Uh, uh, so in order to do that, uh, you know, I think I may have to. I'm compelled to take the next question, which is from Vinay Shaligram. And Vinay, to tell you your question, we have already asked, uh, raised to our distinguished speaker a while ago, and this is how we can have an access to the CLIP programs from India. Uh, I already, you know, I have posed this, uh, in fact, we would be, we would like to ensure and we would like to work on this that can we have a special partnership with CLIP in UK to start off, you know, some special uh, uh, program for a continuing professional development program for our colleagues in India. So this question is from one of our professional colleagues, Vinay Shaligram, who is wanting to know, can the Indian library professionals have an access to CLIP programs? I, I, that sounds like a, a fascinating idea, but I would suggest, um, Sangeeta, that you, you would want to talk with Nick Poole, the Chief Executive of CLIP, who's very open to new partnerships generally. Much. Thank you. Thank you indeed. This is indeed something we really would like to immediately, you know, do that. And I would be requesting also Neeti from here, you know, from BCL here, you know, to help us out in seeing. And that would be a great contribution uh, coming from UK. And that would certainly would be strengthening, you know, the Indo-UK library partnerships. And then it would definitely be wanting to make a big name. We have been planning out for the last few years that how can we really can have Kind of an understanding with an institution of great eminence 
and um, ensuring that we can do these programs. And it's not only the online one, we really want our Indian professionals. There can be some specific exchange programs happening between India and UK, where in our professionals, they go and they see, and then at the same time, yes, inviting our UK library professionals to India and having many more opportunities for doing programs like this, and uh, which will definitely help in building up a more a better professional competencies uh, enhancing that. Thank you very much indeed. We'll just quickly would like to go. Uh, uh, I am just, uh, I, I think there are a lot many questions. I We would be requesting uh, all our attendees and I can see that there are a lot many questions which are being asked. We may like to, you know, make a brief uh, of these questions and may like to, you know, send across uh, through mail uh, because of paucity of time is really not feasible enough. But one question that I may like to ask you is, and that is currently when we talk about the British Library, you have mentioned about the digitization uh, partnerships that you have, wherein you have mentioned about Srishti and Jadapur University, uh, one of the school uh, with whom you are doing it. Besides this, what are the other kind of um, partnerships that British Library has uh, with the other libraries across the globe? Means when we talk about, especially from South Asia, or we talk about India as such, or uh, in general, uh, international collaborations. In general, uh, um, the, the big, the other big um, South Asia pro program is the International Tong Tong project, which is is um, a partnership of um, libraries across Europe and and Asia, um, including India, which is around um, the Silk Road and um, artifacts. I know, but also um, around artifacts that were found along that, that route. That is actually a sort of a, a separately funded project because it's such a massive international cooperation. And the thrust of that is about cataloging, analyzing, making things available digitally across there. We're members of IFLA and um, an organization called. Um, as a national library that there's a, a directors of national libraries group so we meet with national libraries and librarians and library staff from across the globe um are very it's really important that we're part of that community that we learn from each other and that we we do um uh, understand what we're doing and, and why and support each other so uh, the National Libraries Group is, is just for National Libraries. For me, the IFLA Group, again, is another way of learning about what's going on, um, how to work with, and, and how to build those relationships in other countries. I would just like to also share that only a fortnight ago, Delit has also joined IFLA as our institutional member. And we are also looking forward to the visit of the IFLA president, uh, Dr. Barbara Lisson, on 17th. She's going to be there with us uh, here at Delnet, along with SLA president. And uh, uh, one last, uh, uh, you know, just another one or two minutes more from our colleagues here, you know, who are here with us uh, in person, uh, would like to request you if you may like to ask any question to our esteemed speaker. Any question that you may like to ask? Yes, sir. Our distinguished chairperson and our colleague. So, uh, I have a question. You had mentioned that clearly AI going to win uh, by Daniel. You had depicted one in your one slide that AI is going to win, <laughs> going to help in our library partnership in an age of openness. How, what that's our partnerships world of AI. I think in understanding about what it can do. And I think it does have uses in, as I say, um, things like metadata creation, but I think it needs moderating with um, human interface. It has, I mean, a colleague of mine is always mentioning a robot in a Singapore library that was driven by AI, and you will have seen some, some online both helplines are of you know, have AI generated text, but where human interaction has has to be is almost sacred. It is really important. But I have an idea about um, about teaching the 
how it um, can help us learn. Um, are, but getting people to understand that it's not something that you need to continue to okay, does that make makes sense so again it's actually a different sort of information literacy in terms of how people are using information and being aware of how it's created at the same time as looking at how it can make um, our collections and our content more accessible so there are does that make sense and i think by doing that together we can to do that. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, I would uh, uh, like to inform, uh, well, before we go for the vote of thanks, I would just like to inform all our attendees, uh, the online attendees, that on 17th of April, that's on Monday, uh, we are going to have an online uh, talk where we are going to welcome the IFLA president and the SLA president. Uh, we are sending out the invites also today when we are receiving the digital certificate of participation. You will be given the link for registration. But we request you also do join us in person at Delnet New Delhi if you ask how the experience was of our colleagues who have been able to have this wonderful opportunity to meet this, this afternoon you know, you would really feel envious that why you missed out. So please do try to join us in person, you know, and join the programs. And it, it's a great blessing if we are able to cross paths and interact with each other in, the, in, in, in person. So requesting each one of us in the online environment to give us a chance to see you in person on April 17. It's a moment now with great sense of gratitude and uh, sincere, um, Thanks, you know, to the British Council India for giving Delnet uh, a chance. And with Delnet also stands nearly 1,000 professionals who have been there, you know, with us, more than 1,000 professionals who have joined us, not only from India, from different nooks and parts of the world, to be there to celebrate the library partnerships and to celebrate the presence of Mrs. Liz Jolly, the chief librarian at British Library, who is really doing the commendable work at the most prestigious library of the world. And uh, we remain much grateful to you, ma'am, for your very, very gracious presence. Thank you so very much for being so accommodative in, uh, and giving us so much of your time and having the, uh, you know, this wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, it's a new beginning which has been made. I can assure you that, that we have really felt delighted that we have been able to have your presence with us and we can we, we, we as you have said i had you know you have mentioned in your uh, in your presentation that whatever work we are doing but we should also see to it that those impactful studies the success stories should also we should be able to convey you know to our users to our societies so we do really hope and that in the days to come, we will be able to establish some new exciting uh, uh, stories with the British uh, Library. And we have our wonderful colleague here, Mrs. Neeti Saxana, who would always be on our side to uh, really help us in uh, making those dreams to get realized. So thank you so very much, ma'am. And this is on behalf of Delnet, on behalf of the entire uh, Delnet and, and each and everyone who has been truly got inspired with your very gracious presence, we would like to present a memento to you. And uh, this is our uh, talk of honor, and uh, we request you to kindly accept this, presented with great admiration and immense gratitude to you. would be failing in our duties if I do not 
acknowledge you know the the splendid support has been a great honor and pleasure to see Neeti after such a long time a terrific colleague one of the most wonderful colleagues you know for more than 25 years Neeti at least 25 it's a 30 years now yes yeah we started together and always always a great pleasure you know the more you know we interact the more we feel that how much we have been missing each other yes and it has truly been a pleasure to see you and for the splendid stupendous support you have been our supporter you know right from the very first day and that has been uh, making the bonding so very special with you thank you very much Neeti. it's all because of you that we have been able to have the gracious presence of uh, mrs jolly with us and can't really thank you enough this is a very small you know uh, memento with a great great you know thanks to you for making this day a very special one for us and from each one of us you know who are there in person who are there online so please kindly you know this is virtual virtually you are touching this memento those who are here also you are doing it and on your behalf, I'm presenting this to a wonderful colleague of yours all together, Mrs. Neeti Saxena. Uh, towards the closure of today's program i would like to thank uh, also all our colleagues at british council the entire british council library team who have been in, in support in organizing this program uh, we would like to thank each and every participant you know more than two, uh, nearly 2000 i was showing it to uh, liz you know a while ago before we started the program registrations were somewhere around nine one nine seven three and I think when we had started off, my colleagues have been onto the work of, you know, ensuring that whosoever is wanting, you know, by seeing and then approving. So the, we really would like to thank each and everyone who are there in and online uh, with us. Uh, an overwhelming, sub, you know, response that we got to this program. Thank you so much indeed for your time and efforts in joining us online. And a very big thank you to our wonderful people to come from Delhi and CR region. A big thank you. And let's each one of us give you a special applause in joining us in person. And that speaks volumes of your own commitment to be here. We know that those who are too far off, you know, you can't really come and do, do but you are there with us in spirits. You are there, you know, your presence means a lot. So a big thank you to those who have been able to come over here. It's so wonderful to see our colleagues here in person. and. That's what is the beauty of these partnerships, you know, of networking, being together, everyone together. No one is, you know, alone, everyone together. And it's such a wonderful feel of always staying, you know, connected. Thank you so very much, each one of you. Please join hands for everyone else who are there in this hall. So, and that's a thank you to you in a very, very appreciative manner. We remain much grateful. I would also like to thank my own uh, colleagues at Delnet, a highly dedicated team. We work like a very big network family. And my very, very special thanks, you know, to my colleague, Mr. Kushal Goswami, who has technically been coordinating these uh, webinars of Delnet, which we do. Thank you very much, Kushal. My very special thanks also to my colleagues, Mrs. Ranjana, Mr. Deepak Yadav, and uh, Archana, and many other colleagues who have really been significantly contributing. So it's uh, that, you know, to ensure that we are able to have, you know, today's program. Thank you very much, each one of you. Uh, I would uh, be failing if I do not acknowledge uh, the support that we have been receiving for our distinguished governing board members and my very special gratitude to our president, Sri K. Jai Kumarji, who has always, always very supportive and encouraging uh, in organizing uh, the Delnet events. And once again, on behalf, let's each one of us joins our hands together to give a very special applause and also a welcome, you know, as I said earlier, straight away from the airport, you know, Jolly has calmed down. This is, she has not started off her engagement. She has given us a chance to remember that she started off her India's visit, you know, uh, with this program here. So let's wish her a very, very, you know, uh, wonderful stay and the most uh, 
you know, let's stay here and uh, we will always, you have given us the moments to cherish and thank you so very much for making this a very, very special day for us. Thank you, Jolly. All of us, let's join hands together and also to Mrs. Neeti Saxena. Thank you so very much. Uh, we wish uh, each one of you once again uh, uh, for the best of the times ahead. And thank you so very much for providing us with this excellent opportunity to be there with each one of you. Thank you so much. We really look forward to having you with us again on April 17th. Stay happy, stay blessed, stay connected. Always stay online, never go offline. And let's contribute in making the world a better by encouraging and being uh, you know, always engaged with library partnerships. You are there, we are meant to serve the society. So let's continue our resolve to make the world a better place you know, with our most dedicated and consistent efforts. Thank you so very much once again. Thank you, British Council. And thank you so very much. Can't thank you enough, Liz. It's uh, some of the moments wherein you don't find a vocabulary to express yourself. And you have given us you know, those challenging times. We can't really thank you. We can't express. No AI can ever can you know, equate with the human emotions. And we really mean that. Thank you so very much. One across the globe, the global library fraternity who is there with us. Thank you so very much. Much grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all. God bless you all. Thank you so very much. With this, we are closing our today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you.